Good day. My name is Stephen Bryan, and I'd like to welcome you to this Legatum Institute webinar marking the launch of our report into How Nations Succeed. The Legatum Institute's mission is to build a global movement of people committed to creating the pathways from poverty to prosperity. Prosperity is more than material wealth. It encompasses inclusive societies with security and freedom, as well as economic opportunity and also social well-being. Now, creating such a pathway from poverty to prosperity is a goal for many national leaders and the off-stated objective of the international development community. But in many cases, this goal has been elusive. So a few years ago, we set out to ask three questions. Firstly, which nations have successfully transitioned from poverty to prosperity? Then, what differentiates their experience from less successful counterparts? And finally, what role has international development played versus domestic leadership in these transitions? And our hope has been that by answering these questions, we can contribute to the debate on how best to support the development journey for the Global South, providing a perspective for both national leaders and the development community. And this, of course, is a particularly salient issue in the UK, as the Department for International Development has been merged with the Foreign Office, and the reduced aid budget is under increased scrutiny. In undertaking this work, our first task was to identify those nations where there was sustained progress across multiple generations and multiple commodity cycles. So to do so, we took a 60 year arc as the scope of our research, starting in 1960, point of great change as many nations were becoming independent. And we chose the nation state as our unit of analysis because national level characteristics, such as the quality of institutions and economic governance have a disproportionate impact on the lived experience of individuals. And overall, about a dozen countries have progressed from poverty in 1960 to the top half of the Legatum Prosperity Index today. And of these, we decided to focus on six examples from across three continents, Botswana and Mauritius in Africa, Colombia and the Dominican Republic in Latin America, Indonesia and Sri Lanka in Asia. And we chose these less heralded success stories because they better represent realistic examples of journeys that others could follow, rather than say the harder to replicate icons of development, such as China or South Korea. Now to understand the choices made and the experiences that enable their progress, we contrasted their trajectories with those of four countries that were similarly positioned in 1960, but have failed to fully realize their potential, albeit in a variety of different ways. And these countries were Jordan, Kenya, Sierra Leone, and Nicaragua. And following the rough contours of the prosperity index, we found discernible differences in how the successful nations exercised the monopoly of force, protected civil rights, enshrined political accountability, and established economic models, including the promotion of property rights and the role of state monopolies. We also saw how that translated to different approaches to ensuring the social well being of the population, for example, how education and health systems were built out. In short, the leaders of emergent nations made different choices, many of which we believe could also be made by others. And today, in order to explore a leader's perspective on what's needed to realize this national ambition, I'm delighted to be joined by a set of distinguished panelists. They include Her Excellency Yamina Karachani, the High Commissioner for the Republic of Rwanda to the UK, Alexander Danner, former Foreign Affairs Minister of Australia, Mr. Stephen Karingi, Senior Director of the Economic Commission for Africa, Sir Paul Collier, Professor of Economics and Public Policy at the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford. Ms. Claire Akamanzi, CEO of the Rwandan Development Board. And finally, Professor Lam Pritchard, former Senior Fellow at the Centre for Global Development. And we very much look forward to hearing their thoughts. But first, I'd like to introduce Molly Canary, the lead researcher for the report, to outline some of its key findings. Thank you, Stephen, and good afternoon to you all. Uh, let me also add my thanks to everyone who's joined us today to discuss precisely how nations succeed, and especially those who gave their time, talents, and donations in order to make this report possible. I am profoundly grateful to you all. I, as Stephen said, will be sharing some of the key lessons we learned along the way. Probably the most important, and one I wish to highlight right at the top, is that the development of nations remains a fundamentally mysterious process. 
insofar as development is behavioral change, sending one's daughters to school, refusing to pay a bribe or starting a new business, our macro analysis relies upon the tiny decisions made by families and individuals every day. We ought not minimize the role of luck and chance in these decisions and in the process of development writ large. That being said, as promised, uh, we do have some key lessons to share. I will begin with specifics before moving on to some more general themes. First, territorial control is key but it does not appear that conflict necessarily needs to be eliminated for development to progress. Rather, it must be contained amid continual efforts to reestablish control. The presence of Colombia and Sri Lanka among the more successful nations studied in this report indicates the importance of leaders' intent and attitude. President Cesar Gaviria of Colombia once said that even in the darkest days of his country's violent struggle against narco traffickers and left and right wing paramilitary groups, he never questioned the viability of the state. That strength of belief appears to be critical in holding countries together at moments of great peril. Second, a national identity is key, and this need not be strictly organic in order to be effective. Indonesia's Pancasila, the five principles, its new national philosophy at the point of independence and the creation of Bahasa Indonesia as a national language helped to bridge the divide between the many ethnicities, religions and languages found across its 17,000 islands. Third, leadership matters. The experiences which shape the life of an individual also undeniably color how that individual makes decisions once in office. We should not assume that equally competent people would perform the same job to the same standard. Character matters. The personal difficulties encountered by the first and second presidents of Botswana, Suretse Kama and Katmasire, with their respective tribes almost certainly influenced their determination to centralize the control and revenue streams of Botswana's mineral wealth which proves central to the government's ability to enact a long-term developmental agenda. A few final thoughts on the nature of development from what we saw across the 10 countries we studied. Development is frustratingly slow. The time required to create prosperous societies and cohesive nation states is measured in generations. As with so much in life, those promising quick or easy fixes are probably not to be trusted. Development is fundamentally endogenous or internally driven. There is a low ceiling on how much outsiders can influence the developmental trajectory of a country, partially because it is an intergenerational process. Development is messy. As Ha Jun Chang often reminds his readers, the processes by which the West became prosperous took centuries and involved compromises which wrote which would be deeply unpalatable to modern moral sentiment. What is good in a moral sense is not necessarily relevant to the development process. And finally, the institutional characteristics of development appear to be at least as important as the economic. This is not in and of itself a controversial statement, but if we believe this to be true, we are forced rapidly to depart from the easily quantifiable and move on to more nebulous subjects like the social contract, effectively what is required to bind a nation together. An assumption held at the beginning of this work that the increasingly precise measurement of trivialities is unlikely to change the world informed the decision to try and tackle, however imperfectly, these big ideas. I hope, I think we all hope, that this is only the beginning of this conversation. And I will now hand back to Stephen and our distinguished panel. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Very um, interesting uh, overview of the lessons learned. So next we move on to our keynote speaker, Her Excellency Yamina Karatani. We look forward to hearing more about Rwanda's remarkable journey of transformation over the last 25 years as it approaches the midpoint of perhaps its own 60 year arc. Your Excellency. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stephen, and uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, fellow panelists. I am delighted to join you this afternoon. And first, let me commend the important work that the Legatum Institute delivers, such as the report we are discussing today, How Nations Succeed. 
And as highlighted in the report, for nations to develop, they must develop themselves. The focus on the internal drivers for nations to um, develop were greatly highlighted and I shall endeavor, endeavor to share the factors I feel were integral part of our Rwanda's experience. Before colonialism, nation building had been an integral part of the Rwandan culture. A few decades before and after gaining independence in 1962, Rwanda's politics were driven by ethnic division and hate. For colonialism to be effective, divide and rule was applied to ensure social cohesion never thrived. The leaders at independence opted to carry on the same principles, further enhancing tribal and regional divides. Several waves of killings of Tutsis took place starting in 1959 and culminating in the genocide against the Tutsi in 1994. Post-independence Rwanda failed to build the nation. In fact, quite the opposite ensued. When we speak of the genocide against the Tutsi, we focus on the million plus lost lives, but the damage was much more pronounced. We had a stagnating economy shrank by 50%, 64% inflation rate, a 78% poverty rate, an overwhelming number of displaced persons, about three and a half million, and more than 140,000 genocide suspects in overcrowded prisons. The socioeconomic fabric was destroyed and the infrastructure was dilapidated. The hope of living drastically faded as life expectancy in Rwanda dropped to 29 years in 1994. So a complete restart was required, but we had huge capacity gaps and weak institutional frameworks. 96% of civil servants had no higher education. So the war was over, but we needed a recipe for peace. Leadership equipped with character and competence was required. And after stopping the genocide, the Rwandan Patriotic Army led by President Paul Kagame quickly focused on building the trust required to deliver the political, economic and social transformation that was to serve as oxygen for our nation. The post-genocide government of Rwanda prioritized restoring security and order as a precondition for the country's recovery in all aspects of life. A new governance and political system was established, built on unity, consensus and dialogue, rule of law, transparency and accountability, inclusiveness and participation of all citizens. Particular efforts were deployed in the reconciliation process in order to mend the social fabric that had been destroyed. All the above were given priority and results were carefully monitored so as to improve, adjust and set policies that would directly respond to the challenges Rwandans faced. Vision 2020 became Rwanda's development blueprint, the medium strategy currently driving the country towards its vision, the national strategy for transformation aims at accelerating economic growth and development founded on the private sector. The long-term future prospects of the country are embedded in Vision 2050. So key success uh, factors can be summed up as visionary leadership, good governance and accountability, inclusive development model, homegrown initiatives, use of ICT, investment in human capital and results oriented institutional framework. Ladies and gentlemen, Rwanda ranks as the seven most efficient government globally. We consistently score high in the World Bank doing business reports and global competitiveness reports. We have the highest representation of women in parliament, uh, currently at 61.3%, and women constitute 50% of our cabinet. For two decades, Rwanda has maintained a steady growth of economic um, 
uh, uh, steady economic growth of 8% and continues its pursuit to become a middle income country in spite of challenges brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. And as we learned from this report, building institutions aimed at forging a strong social contract, building an open economy and investing in human capital are all key to moving from poverty to prosperity. To achieve the above, emphasis must be put on the leadership's ability to focus on long-term instead of only short-term goals, often driven by political cycles. And it can never be emphasized enough that for a nation's vision to succeed, government's ability to translate it to its citizens so they can contribute and own the process of implementing that vision is of paramount importance. In the case of Rwanda, that trust was hard earned and we do not take it for granted. Always aspiring to accomplish more, empowering Rwandans to do their part by creating the right ecosystem to see as many dreams realized. Previous generations of Rwandans suffered through bad leadership. The current generation has tasted the initial harvest of good leadership and it will be the duty of the next generations to consolidate the gains and build on them so as to catch up with the tremendous time we have lost. As I draw my remarks to a close, let me remind us all that external factors must also complement internal national efforts. The right leadership will indeed create an enabling environment and accomplish all that I mentioned above. However, there is a role beyond a given nation, that which belongs to the global community, which must also act with intent to support sustainable growth, the kind which reduces balance of payments, offers favorable borrowing rates to developing countries, or as seen in the case of the COVID-19 pandemic, there must be action to ensure that there is reduced inequality based on lack of access to vaccine or higher costs of vaccines being quoted for the poorest nations. Oftentimes, we find ourselves entangled into unforgiving web of complex economic pacts, favoring those who already have an economic advantage and punishing the ones hoping to improve their manufacturing industries and adding values to their export. So I end with a quote from President Paul Kagame, which says, and I quote, we do not want to be a status quo country or a status quo people. Vision 2020 was about what we had to do in order to survive and regain our dignity. But Vision 2050 has to be about the future we choose because we can and because we deserve it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Your Excellency, for that, uh, that very interesting uh, perspective on Rwanda's journey so far. And we, wish it, we wish it well uh, as it heads through to 2050. So let me now turn to our, to our panel to, uh, to seek their perspectives and insights. Um, what I'd love to do first is really take this idea of the social contract and explore it a bit further. And maybe first turning to Lant and then, then Alexander uh, with the following sort of thought or question. And really what I want to dig into a little bit is when we think about the basics of national development, it includes you know, functioning government with sufficient administrative capacity as Rex and Lee has talked about the challenge that Rwanda faced in the mid nineties. But I wonder whether we've underplayed the importance of these core elements in the debate, development debate recently. Um, Lance, where, where, where are you on this, this particular topic? Yeah, I, I feel very strongly that we have in the sense that particularly in the international development community by being so focused on the implementation of projects and programs targeted at specific groups, I think we've underemphasized the broad-based capabilities that are required for that. So rather than you know, focus on really specific poverty programs or really specific interventions, 
um, we, those often take for granted that the fundamentals of a capable state exist. And often by attempting to do too much too soon with too little for too few, meaning really hyper-specific programs, we ignore the need of the government and of the society to build a broad and inclusive uh, approach to development that benefits everyone, such that there's broad-based support for the building of the fundamental capability of the state. So I think in many ways, the, the development uh, industry's uh, instinct have gone too far towards targeting and away from the broad capabilities that are necessary really for a social contract that underpins a capable state. Th thank you, thank you, Lance. So Alexander, as you've shifted from foreign affairs to diplomacy, now to, now to academia, you've seen, you've seen many angles of this. It'd be great to get your, uh, your thoughts on that. Well, so I spent nearly 12 years as the Australian Foreign Minister, being the minister inter alia responsible for the aid programme. And I used to say to the then Australian aid agency, AusAid, so why exactly your question, why are some countries rich and some countries poor? Um, and as I travelled around, particularly the Indo-Pacific region and got to know that region very well and looked at some of the richer and some of the poorer countries, and since then, I mean, um, I'm delighted to hear the excellent thoughts of the Rwandan High Commissioner, um, because I myself have been to Rwanda and seen the extraordinary things they've achieved there. So as I've travelled around, I think I have come to some pretty tough conclusions about this issue, which more or less agree with your paper. Um, and I put them in, in this order. First of all, um, it is true there needs to be a sense of nationhood. Um, and that is easily said and not easily achieved. And I think, you know, taking Rwanda um, and Rwanda's president, who sometimes gets criticised in the West, when your country in 1994 was in a state of genocide and you've managed to pull it together since then by creating a sense of national unity um, and common purpose, that has to go down as a huge achievement. Um, secondly, I actually think there is far too much, too, too little emphasis on this issue, and that is the notion of individual property rights. Um, property rights which are transferable, are tradable, um, and property rights which are protected by an independent judiciary and a professional legal system. I just don't think you can underestimate the importance of that. The reason that Britain moved into the agricultural revolution and eventually the industrial re re uh, revolution is worth looking back at. Um, the agricultural revolution was stimulated by the gradual breakup of common land, um, church-owned land and the like, and eventually individuals um, uh, owned land and it was transferable. So you also had bigger... Um, entities as people, some people sold their land because they didn't want to be farmers and so on. Um, so um, I think countries that people talk about corruption, sure, corruption is bad and is not going to help. Um, but, but it is a sort of corruption if the government or someone else can just move in and confiscate property or there isn't a concept of individual property rights, but just of collective property. In other words, no one owns the property, um, which is quite a problem in a number of countries because that is their cultural and historic um, uh, tradition. And I spoke, so I would place huge emphasis on that. And finally, um, everyone else set, has said it and I'll say it, education. Um, you need, um, you need, first and foremost, a really well-educated and professional civil service. Um, and you need um, to skill up your civil service, service. If you have only, you know, 10 or 20 civil servants who are really very professional, well, then the government as the administrator of the country is just not going to make it work. Um, so you do need um, a highly educated civil service. You need highly educated professionals. Uh, in medicine, the law, of course, as I've been emphasizing, and then the general populace. Um, so, um, you know, I think, I, I think it's the, if you like, the rule of law 
um, individual property rights, individ uh, um, credible, incorruptible judiciaries um, to settle property disputes, a government that respects property rights and an educated civil service. If you put those things together, you know, this is my last point, then someone will bother to invest in your country. I'm not going to name countries in this seminar, um, but I know them. Why will people not invest in those countries? Because, um, because they're not confident that the millions they might put in or even thousands they might put into a project in that country won't be com confiscated. Sovereign risk, it's called. There's too much sovereign risk. So reduce the sovereign risk, encourage the investors, but protect the investors through the rule of law. And then people will invest and the economy will grow and poverty will start to fall behind. Right. Lovely. Thank, thank you. Perhaps now I could, I could turn to Paul and then also Stephen and, and think a little bit about the early stage of Rwanda's transition. What can we learn from that transition from conflict uh, to help other fragile nations strengthen and build out their social contracts to, to take those first steps on the journey to prosperity. Paul, perhaps we could start with your thoughts. Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks. Um, you know, I think the starting point in all this is that we, the West, outsiders, cannot save them, the poor, right? Um, uh, that is the great delusion of a lot of uh, Western thinking. We are the saviors who will save them. Uh, once you're down that route, you, you're, you're dead. You're, you're worse than dead, you're a menace, right? Um, the saints of development, what a menace, right? Um, so um, uh, the realization that outsiders have a pretty modest role, which is supporting those domestic processes where they happen um, of, of people developing a strategy um, to, to save themselves, basically, as a, as a society. Um, and um, that starts with, um, we need a, a state which um, builds the sinews of the, of the economy. Um, I don't believe at all in the uh, libertarian uh, West Coast American utopia of uh, the stateless successful society. Um, the nearest we got to trying it is Somalia, and I don't think it's that successful myself, but I tell my libertarian billionaires, why don't you move there if you think it's so wonderful. Um, so um, we need to build, the, sin the state needs to build the sinews of, of the state, and that's security, uh, enforcement of contract, um, uh, and the economic infrastructure uh, that is vital. So Rwanda is an amazing example of an ability to do that, despite uh, terrible conditions initially. I mean, if you wanted a do not start from here, you would have Rwanda in 1994. Um, just emerged from a totally murderous genocide, um, uh, but much worse than that, it was, it was a, deeply landlocked, it hadn't got any natural resources, it was overpopulated by most measures, um, and uh, the, 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 estate, the state, never that effective, had been destroyed, um, as the High Commissioner said. And yet, and yet it's achieved a rate of poverty reduction right up there with China. That is an astonishing achievement, right? And how's it done it? By great ingenuity and really very effective leadership um, in building some sense of forward-looking common purpose. That's really hard. Um, and so I'll give you just one example of, of building an economic strategy in a very, very constrained situation. So you've no natural resources, you're overpopulated, what can you do? Um, and so Rwanda decided, well, let's build a tourist industry. Let's get people to come here. Um, that sounded pretty unlikely. You don't have a coast. Um, you don't have much land. Um, um, you don't even have that many animals. Um, uh, and, um, 
uh, right, so, so Andrew got a terrible reputation. Um, they've done it though. They've done it. I, I was I was there just to, just the eve of co of COVID lockdown, um, and uh, and a government minister who I working with uh, proudly told me we're we're now the second most visited country in the whole of Africa. From nothing, the second most visited country in the whole of Africa. How they done it? Well, they had an integrated strategy build the conference center so that people can come to conferences. How do they get there? Well, let's, let's start an airline and make it a really efficient airline um, so that you've got connectivity, physical connectivity. Um, let's make the process of coming as painless as possible. Let's provide on the ground security. I have walked across the streets of Kigali at midnight alone and felt completely safe something I could not do in my own capital city. Right? Um, uh, it advertised. I took my kid to see the Arsenal match and all around the Arsenal was come to Rwanda, come to Rwanda, emblazoned everywhere. Right? Uh, a, an advertising campaign for which Rwanda was much criticized. It was very smart. Right? So Rwanda did it bit by bit. And we know from rigorous statistical evidence is also creating a more unified society, less conscious of tribal identity and more conscious of this new forward looking, exciting Rwandan identity. So it's an astonishing achievement. Um, and, uh, and, and there's very much to learn from Rwanda. I mean, one final point, sorry, I've gone on. But people are learning from Rwanda. Um, uh, the same process is about to happen thanks to Rwanda that we saw 40 years ago in East Asia. In East Asia, four little countries happened to get ahead. Right? And the rest of East Asia then started to copy them. And it spread, you know, most famously, when Deng Xiaoping went to visit Singapore and thought, I wonder if we could do this, let's try. Right? and Shanghai. That's starting to happen with people looking to Rwanda. Um, I'll give you one funny example. Um, I work very closely with the government of Ghana, very fine government. And, uh, and uh, one of the government ministers was proudly telling me, um, and the high commissioner will, will be amused by this. He said, we now deliver more blood by drones than Rwanda does. Okay? We've, we've overtaken them in blood deliveries by drone. That's the spirit of emulation that is going to transform Africa. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Paul. Um, Stephen, great to get your, uh, your, your, your thoughts on, on, on that, uh, that transition that Rwanda has made, particularly again, thinking back about post-conflict, bringing people together again. No, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, let me acknowledge uh, my fellow panelists and also the, mm -hmm. the ambassador. So I like the, the, the definition or at least a statement by Minouche that um, uh, social contracts are fundamentally values driven. And so solutions are going to vary across, across societies. I think this is a, a, an interesting point, point to start. Um, the other thing that I would want to, to mention uh, here is that um, for a social contract, like the one now we see in Rwanda to, to, to happen, uh, beyond uh, the leadership, beyond the leadership like we have had even from the, from the report of the Legatum Institute and also the, what the ambassador has told us, what uh, Rwanda has done, you also need resources to be able to do that. So the interesting thing is that for Africa today, we have a tax to GDP ratio of 17%. 17% of GDP is what we have as our tax to GDP ratio. And so the question is, is it possible for you to build a social contract with this kind of resources? Because for you to have a social contract, there are expectations from the population and the government on, its, on, on the other side and the state it also has to incur some cost to be able to deliver to deliver on this on, on these things. I am saying this because what COVID-19 has done 
is that it has sort of pushed African countries, among them fragile uh, countries, uh, to at least attempt to, to shift their budget or to get additional resources so that at least they can deal with the vulnerabilities that the populations were facing. And these are the kind of vulnerabilities that you would expect that where you have a cohesive social contract, uh, the population would not have to worry. So what is it that we have learned out of, out of this? The first thing is that um, for many African countries, the social contract, as we have seen during this time of COVID-19, it has been very heavily dependent on external resources. And that brings the question, is it possible that such can be sustained beyond the pandemic? And this is where the issue, the, the, the lesson from Rwanda uh, comes in. I don't think I need to, to, to revisit the statistics of where Rwanda has come from and how it has transited from fragility to prosperity. But I think there are three things that I would like to highlight. And I think Paul uh, Collier has actually mentioned one of them. One of the things is that Rwanda did a lot of work in terms of public financial management, in particular, the budget process. Uh, involving the people, uh, ensuring that there is accountability. Uh, those of you who follow uh, the, 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 the political process in, uh, in, uh, in Rwanda, you do know that um, there is what we call a gathering. In Kiswahili, we call it baraza, whereby uh, leaders from the lowest part, uh, from the lowest unit, actually come and give, uh, give a statement of what, it is, what they are doing in terms of meeting the commitments uh, to the people. The other thing that Rwanda has done is that it has mobilized domestic uh, revenue. So we can actually uh, go back to what Paul has said in terms of uh, creating a whole sector almost out of nothing. And then of course, using those resources to be able to finance uh, this social contract. And then of course, it has strengthened some of the institutions. And I think here I would like to point out uh, the strengthening of the central bank uh, so that at least the private sector can actually be able to operate in an environment where uh, policies are, are, are predictable. So, so there, there is that building of the state, and then there's the question of making sure that you have the resources uh, to finance and to advance uh, this state and the contract that you have uh, with the people. And I think this is a lesson that, uh, that Africa and other countries uh, that may be in similar situation or that may find themselves in similar situation like Rwanda did uh, a few decades ago uh, that, they, that they can do. And I think this is a lesson that um, from the macro point of view, I would like to highlight. Thank you. Right, uh, thank, thank you, Stephen, very, um, very interesting. So uh, Claire, we may be able to bring you in now to have a, have a think through the sort of, what's it gonna take to boost trade and to develop regional value chains? If we, we start to think about the next stage of evolution of, of an economy to integrate it more regionally. Uh, it'd be great to get your thoughts on, on, on that stage of the development process. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Stephen. And, and it's, thank you very much to the panelists, uh, Stephen, uh, Paul, Alexander, for, for the comments. I think you made my work easier, but some of the examples that you shared from Rwanda. But I, I, in terms of just sharing uh, how we thought about growing Rwanda's economy, and, and I think um, when our president was asked a question on uh, what, to, what it took for him to, to drive a country to where Rwanda had reached, he, he talked about three areas that he thought were very important. And I think, first of all, the, 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 the question or the point about leadership uh, driving citizens uh, towards transformation, I think, is really important. And I think. Uh, what we've seen in Rwanda is that the leadership led a very strong mindset shift. And I think that mindset shift is very critical in everything that we did as Rwanda. And that mind mindset shift was uh, that most importantly, we're going to own our future as a country. We're going to decide as a country where we want to go and we're going to drive the programs that we think make sense for us uh, as a people or as a country. And to do that, Rwanda made uh, three choices. Uh, the leadership and the people of Rwanda made three choices. The first choice was um, in everything that we do as we drive socioeconomic transformation, we are going to ensure that unity of our people is very important. That was the first choice. The second is that we're going to think uh, bold, ambitious, and big in, in terms of where we want to go. We're not going to shy for, from having an ambitious program and an ambitious transformation strategy and plan that gets us there. That was the second. And then the third is we're going to hold ourselves with, uh, with very high standards of accountability 
so that we can hold ourselves accountable, but our people can hold the leadership accountable and the people can hold each other accountable. So those three things, uh, unity, um, thinking big, and then accountability were the three big areas that I think I want to expound on, on how Rwanda uh, really managed it, it, itself. And I think on the issue of unity, I probably won't spend a lot of time there because Ambassador Yamina uh, talked about it very clearly. But just giving some of the examples of what we did is how do we make sure that everybody in the country participates in our, our transformation plan. So even if we had a very difficult past of divisionism, how do we put institutions that support unity? So we had the Unity and Reconciliation Commission. We had um, the Gachacha um, justice system that also promoted um, uh, reconciliation. We had decentralization system where everyone participates from the smallest village to the national level at different levels of uh, decentralization. And then interestingly, also power sharing. If you look at the leading political party today, RPF, when we go into elections, they win you know, over 90%. But the constitution cannot allow them to dominate power, even if they're the most popular political party. So the RPF today can only, even if they win by 90% of the vote, they can only occupy 50% of cabinet. And the other 50% of cabinet has to come from the other political parties as well. Again, unity and reconciling and sharing of power so that everybody is part of the agenda. And then also, uh, the president of the country and the speaker of parliament cannot come from the same political party. It doesn't matter how they, um, um, the, the, the best party performed in an election. So that kind of unity, I think, was a very important foundation for everything that Rwanda did. And of course, returning refugees from all over, the, especially from DRC, and bringing refugees to be part of the, the country. And children whose parents participated in the genocide cannot be hold, held victim. They also participate. And some of them are actually part of the government today. So unity was very important. But let me go to the second big uh, area, which is uh, thinking big uh, and, and bold and ambitious. That was really important. There's no way that you can think about prosperity or transformation without thinking about where you want to go and, and, and actually being ambitious about it. And, and Ambassador Yamina did talk about our vision. It starts with um, a vision. Where do you want to go? And can you articulate that clearly? So for us, it was a vision 2020, and now it's vision 2050 clearly going into very specific targets. I want, we want our per capita income to grow from this number to this number. We want um, our, our, our GDP to grow by a certain you know, 8% on average or double digit, very clearly for every period we've, uh, we've, we've uh, stated that. Another big ambition is we want to become a country that takes governance seriously. We want a safe country, a clean country, clean physically, but also clean in terms of governance. And today, if you look at where Rwanda is, we are ranked by Gallup Report as the fifth safest place to work at night globally, especially for women, very good thing. World Economic Forum ranked us as the seventh most, most efficient government um, in 2017. Uh, Transparency International, 47th in, in um, fighting corruption and fourth in Africa. Business environment was also very important. We decided that being 158th in the world in, a, in, the, in, the, in, in terms of doing business was not something that we were proud of. I remember our president challenged us and said, can you think about being the top 10 in the world? Now imagine you're ranking 158 and then you're thinking, I'm going to do everything I can to become top 10. It sounds impossible. But today Rwanda is ranked 38th in the world. A few years ago, we even ranked 29th in the world. So that level of thinking big and ambitious. Now, when it comes to the private sector, uh, specifically Stephen, thinking about how do we actually create an environment apart from the business environment that I talked about where we rank, uh, 38th in the world and second in Africa. How do we create an environment where we can catalyze and accelerate uh, private investments in the country? There are a few things that we did. One was infrastructure, and I think Paul Kole did talk about some of those. Coming up with, an, um, with a, a bold vision of uh, building fiber optic infrastructure for 4G LTE network in the country, and today 95% of the country is covered uh, with that. And national airline, and Paul did talk about that, Rwanda, very expensive undertaking, but we did that um, plane by plane, and now we have a fleet of over a dozen. A new airport, a new convention center. Just this week, Rwanda is hosting the NBA Basketball League. It was possible because one of the reasons it was possible is because we built a Kigali Arena, which was uh, at the standard that NBA found um, um, you know, attractive for them to have their basketball inaugural league here in Rwanda with capacity of over 10,000 people. So building infrastructure was one very key thing. The second one was also just liberalizing our economy. Today, Rwanda, in Rwanda, you cannot, you can do business in any sector. You're not stopped from doing in any sector, whether it's telecom, mining, 
um, infrastructure, the sectors are open for an economy. And then also thirdly, the government playing a role that is catalytic. You know, uh, sometimes private sector looks at so many risk factors before they decide to invest, but how does the government show the way? And we did that in many of our key sectors. For example, telecoms. The first time we wanted a telecom company to come, uh, we invited MTN and we put most of the money for investment. We asked them to bring the expertise most importantly. Today, MTN owns um, um, most of the company and they've listed some of the shares as well. Serena Hotel, we had no five-star hotel. And uh, of course, private sector was going to take its time to do that. We, um, as a government, invested in the first five-star hotel. And today you have Marriott, you have Radisson, you have Park Inn. So that catalytic uh, role was very, very important uh, for government as well. And those were some of the areas that we really put in a lot of effort so that we can drive economic growth, drive investment and become attractive uh, for investment. Still, I'll stop, I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Claire. If I could just turn very briefly to Paul, just to, to pick up on some of those thoughts. And as you, you know, advise and, and, and uh, review with governments um, around the world, what they have to do to create this attractive environment for business, you know, there's often criticism of chasing the ratings in terms of just simply going after the World Bank doing business index, for example. But what would be your, your advice to governments about how to think about that, how to emulate that shift from 130 fifth to 38th in the world without doing a very narrow job? But what's the mindset, the holistic approach to changing the environment that you see is needed? Well, I mean, it, it's exactly what uh, has just been uh, described really by um, uh, Claire Akamanzi. Um, that, that is to say, you've got to think big. You've got to be, but you, it's about transformation for goodness sake. Transformation is not, business as usual plus a bit. Um, it's not trying to fiddle an index to get you from 158th to 147th. It's bold, big, bold. If it isn't big and bold, you're already lost. Big and bold doesn't come with guarantees. There's, it's a journey into uncertainty. How do you manage that journey into uncertainty by expecting to have to learn and adjust as you go. And that was again part of the genius of, of Rwanda was getting rapid feedback by accountability. I've, I, I was privileged to actually be the, the one foreigner attending that annual gathering. And it was impressive, you know? Um, it, first of all, it was held in, a, in, a, in an army camp. Um, um, I ate in the same table as President Kagami, and I tell you, we ate the same food as everybody else there, and it was an army camp, so it wasn't great, right? It wasn't a gourmet experience, um, but it was an experience in um, actually um, holding everybody to account from the top to the bottom and back again. Right. You know? right. And so you got bold but you got rapid feedback not just on what was going right but on what was going wrong if you could say we failed in the last year with this objective but we in the process we learned why we failed that was entirely acceptable huh? if you came up with a load of flannel as to why you'd really succeeded although you'd failed that wasn't acceptable. And so there was a rapid learning and error correction mechanism. Without that error correction mechanism, which comes from this rigorous right the way down accountability, you're doomed because you're just in a journey to an uncertain destination and you never learn how to get there. So that was the genius that did it. And let me, one little anecdote on Rwanda again, right? Um, so, Yes, they got all these hotels, great. Um, uh, yes, you got the, camp, the conference center, all that was wonderful. And that lovely story about how to get the, 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 the basketball players there, you know, that was, that's a sort of ingenuity. But the best, the most ingenious thing in my view was the animals. Um, Rwanda didn't have as many animals as it would have liked. But it thought, well, the animals can leave, the animals can come back. Um, they've got legs, or they can be put on a plane, or whatever. And so um, uh, the, the, the stock of animals in a country is endogenous. You can change it. And Rwanda did. That was just such a genius thing to do. 
If people want to look at animals that you haven't got, well, get them. Yeah? Great, great. Could I, I'd like to just touch on uh, one sort of final aspect before we wrap up and turn to Lant in particular, because I think your, your work on education in the past, one of the things that we saw when we looked at the difference between the more successful and the less successful countries was the likes of Botswana and others really built up and you know, systematically took over and ran their education systems in a way that some less successful countries have continued to need external support. And obviously, with the pandemic, we see with health, with education, fragile systems that are you know, desperately stressed, whereas others that are more resilient have been able to support their, their, their countries. I'm just wondering what your perspective is on how, how does a nation, having generated wealth through an economic model, ensure those resources go into the well-being and the infrastructure, the sort of social infrastructure, health, education, that's needed to make sure people genuinely benefit from prosperity? Right. I think there's a very important set of facts to understand, particularly about education. I'm going to talk less about health, which is one of the striking things about the world is the amazing extent to which nearly every government in the world has actually managed to push more kids in school. So if you look back the, where the average increase in the years of schooling of the adult population has gone up from about two years to about seven years, which is about five years increase. But what's amazing is how uniform that increase has been. So it differentiates successful from unsuccessful countries is not being able to put butts in seats. Nearly every government for a variety of reasons has mobilized the resources and the logistical capability to expand the education system to bring in more kids, keep them in school longer. What differentiates countries is what those kids learn and the skills and capabilities they acquire in school. And around that, the countries in the world differ night and day. They differ night and day across the world. They differ night and day within Africa. So that, it turns out, maintaining an effective system is about much, much more than getting resources into the system. So when we talk about social contract and we talk about accountability, our basic premise of our research on education is that two things. One, you have to want it. Many of the governments have been going through the motions of schooling, but not really committed to education. So the first thing we see is, you know, we're doing, you know, we're economists, we're doing all kinds of fancy empirical things. But ultimately, when we compare successful and unsuccessful countries, we find countries that have really dedicated themselves and want an educated population and have a drive for it, work in ways like Paul has talked about to develop accountability and feedback mechanisms to achieve success. Whereas lots of governments in the world are just literally going through the motions and hence no amount of resources is gonna produce success. We have countries around the world that have doubled and tripled the per capita spend on kids and had no improvement in learning from it because they weren't really, didn't really have a vision and they weren't really working towards a goal. Um, and then second, I think what, again, what Paul was describing and what Claire was describing is an account-based accountability that people really need to be held to account for performance in a way that becomes part of a feedback loop versus part of a just bureaucratic process. So I think the system needs to have clear goals and the system needs to be driven towards those goals in a way that people, and again, I'm just echoing many of the things Paul said about the economy is equally true of education. But I wanna stress that it is not the case that successful countries have put kids in school and unsuccessful countries haven't. That's not at all what differentiates success. What differentiates success is the countries that have put their kids into schools where learning and skills and capability acquisition which was going, which, which was going on versus countries in the world that have been going through the motions of schooling without producing any real education. And that is what differentiates uh, success or failure in my mind. Great, great, well, thank you, thank you. That's uh, it's really, really helpful differentiation. So I think we're, we're coming up close to the end of the hour. Um, I'd love to get some just very brief reflections, perspectives from around the, around the panel. Particularly when I look at what we've just been discussing, a lot of agreement, a lot of common ideas, but yet, you know, a long distance from the vision of Rwanda versus many other practices. Maybe Alexander, maybe we could start with you in terms of what makes this so hard? Um, well, you know, why, why do these good ideas not sort of automatically get picked up and run with? 
Um, well, I think it's typically about politics. I mean, in, I, you can't underestimate the importance of um, of the individuals who run these countries. I mean, I've seen it uh, not so much in Africa, but in Asia, um, where you might have some kind of kleptocratic regime with a lack of accountability, which basically runs an extractive society in the interests of um, the leadership and the elites, um, those associated with the leadership. I mean, it's a, it's a very, very common phenomenon versus, um, you know, we talked a lot about Rwanda. Of course, there's a great focus on Rwanda, but one of the things that really is striking about Rwanda is the enormous effort from the president down that's made um, to ensure that development and economic progress, social progress is broadly defined inclusive, that um, everybody has a sense that they have a stake in it and they can win out of it. So you don't have to travel many miles um, without mentioning any names from Rwanda um, to see other models at work where um, it's not just corruption, it's, it, it, it is in the, in, the, in the words of the book, um, the, the elites running essentially an extractive society, running the society in their own interests, not in the broader um, community interests. That, that I think is, and so it does boil down to, it boils down to people. I mean, I can name, and I've seen at work, good leaders, um, not just Paul Kagame, but, I, I, but including him. I have seen good leaders. Um, but gosh, there are some shocking cases. Um, and one of the one of the um, one of the characteristics of poor leadership sort of goes to what we've all been saying on this panel. Um, a characteristic of poor leadership is to blame everyone else, blame the colonial powers, history, exploitation, um, you know, any manner of excuses. America. Um, capitalists, capitalists, robber barons, all this sort of stuff. Um, whereas in truth, the success of, and not enough foreign aid, where is the IMF, uh, where is the World Bank, where are the uh, aid agencies? We need more, we need more. This is a very bad sign in any country. Where is the drive internally to make the changes? They have to be driven from within. Um, and I think it was Paul who made the point about the aid industry. I mean, honestly, you think you can fly into one of these countries with a bag full of money and change the whole destiny of the country? Um, it, 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 look, I can promise you I spent billions as the aid minister, billions and billions. Uh, some of it worked okay. Most of it was um, ultimately fairly much wasted and played well domestically, but no, it's internally. It's within themselves that these countries have to succeed. Um, all we need to do as outsiders is tell them that they should have the confidence to succeed and the internal structure to succeed. Can I just say one other thing with Paul? Um, I don't know that always thinking big, when he was saying that, I was thinking of President Nkrumah and his steelworks. I'm not sure I'll be a bit careful about always. Be, I mean, I have flown Air Rwanda and it's a pretty good, I, I give them a bit of an ad here, extremely comfortable and very efficient and it, it was on time. Um, but they've been brilliant at exploiting the, um, you know, the gorillas and the advantages they have. They've done it so well. Thank you. Well, look, one final comment, I think, from Stephen, because you oversee, uh, maybe Paulie, okay. But just from a more holistic perspective, thinking beyond one individual country in your role in the Economic Commission for Africa, do you buy Alexander's argument? And what would be your message to the, the sort of well-wishing aid community? No, I was uh, going to, to, first of all, um, I did actually spend a good amount of time when uh, uh, Alexander was the foreign minister so doing my studies in, um, in Australia. So I do actually understand a bit on what he's saying. Um, mm -hmm. But I was going to, 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 to add that um, actually African countries uh, are making a lot of good progress. I don't think we should add this uh, panel without saying that we have talked about the supply side in terms of the education system. There is actually a demand side to this. So we have the African continental free trade area, 
which is projected to create a significant amount, uh, a significant number of jobs uh, if we implement it properly. Now, and if we have the right training, both at primary, secondary, and uh, higher education, uh, Africa is uh, on a pathway to really realize a vision that they have set themselves. I can link the AFCFT to the issue of the health because we have this uh, huge market in the, in, the, in the health sector, which is likely to be unlocked when you open up the trading of services across, across the continent. So it's not all lost. Um, we are on the right path. And the AFCFT is an initiative of the African people led by the African uh, leaders and actually being implemented by the African institutions, by African institutions. And it's just a matter of making sure that the supply side of our schooling system actually meets the needs of this demand side that the AFCFT and other com continental frameworks are, are, are offering. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Paul, you, you had, did you want one final word? Um, thank you very much, Harry. Um, uh, bold but not but but informed right is the is the answer to um alex alex i think that um in fact there was a wonderful remark by by president irari we must run where others walk and a very clever comment when i was a when i was a student i read the comment yes but it better be in the right direction um and so uh steel mills were bold but they weren't running in the right direction right? Um, let me have a final comment on the role of outsiders, right? Um, we should stop being a nuisance, right? Um, let me give one little, little example, and it's about education. It builds on what Lernt said, right? Um, uh, Rwanda, it's a, sorry, Ghana has to train more than twice the doctors uh, it needs. Why? Because more than half of them leave Ghana and come to Britain. Why do they come to Britain? Because Britain's universities collectively train fewer than half of the uh, medical students we need for the National Health Service. So we, are, with the finest universities in the world, are refusing to spend the little money to train doctors so that we're poaching them from places like Ghana and Sudan. There are more Sudanese doctors working in London than the whole of Sudan. Are we supposed to be proud of this? It's just completely unethical. It's the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing in our, in our policies, right? So um, just uh, trying to be a bit less uh, idiotic in our international efforts um, would, would be a good place to start. So let's let's finish on a Hippocratic oath for the development community of doing doing no harm to start with. So thank you all for a fascinating discussion. Your Excellency Alexander, Claire, Lant, Paul, Stephen, and Molly. Really, uh, really enjoyable conversation. I think we've all learned a lot, and we're going to look forward to the launch of our fifteenth Global Prosperity Index in November, where we'll be capturing the, the sense of this conversation and making sure we impart it into uh, into our forthcoming report. But, Thank you to all the panelists and all those of you online watching. Good afternoon.